the next speaker, uh, I'm very proud that he's here uh, because uh, in uh, our, in what I do uh, running conferences, there are a few um, people that you can look up to as models, role models, and uh, you know, uh, a few conferences are really flying above the pack, I think, uh, very inspirational, and John is certainly running one of these. Uh, he's the founder and director of a series of events uh, that uh, used to happen uh, around the world, and, and the last one was a performance at, in Saint-Etienne, I think. It's called Doors of Perception. You probably have heard of them. Uh, he's also uh, a great uh, man of ideas. Please welcome John Takara. So this is a, a, an extract from a, a film called Dogville, in which there is uh, no scenery, no settings, uh, no things. It's the, it's the last one, Trier, you may know. It's not so famous. But to me, it's a rather wonderful uh, metaphor, or just literally a picture, of a world in which uh, one has the opportunity either to fill it full of stuff or, alternatively, to fill it full of stories and narratives and encounters between people uh, as a choice in terms of what one chooses to do. And the provocation, following on from uh, Dennis, is to say that, um, to me, it's not at all self-evident that we have the right or even the necessity to make many more things at all. Um, when you have the notion that you can make a film with a piece of space and some actors and a story. So that's kind of my starting point. Um, and it's by way of saying that there's a whole lot of words. If we, This is a kind of, imagine that I've unpicked a tag cloud. There's half a dozen words that appear in all the events that we all go to to do with technology and so on. The first is innovation. It's regarded by most people as axiomatic that innovation, of course, innovation is a good thing. I would just offer you the example of um, the carbon economy itself is the result of 200 years of innovation. It's about to wreck the biosphere upon which we depend for life. So it's a, an example of innovation can have bad and good consequences. And as, as the previous speaker said, um, if we don't have some kind of filter or checklist called why are we doing this innovation, what will the results be, it's rather probable that we'll have some unpleasant consequences. Like that, is that better? Future, another word that's uh, overused. Um, there's uh, partly because uh, a future, if we all talk about the future, it uh, removes us from being responsible for what is happening today. I don't want to be moralistic about it, it but just there is a kind of industry called futures that uh, causes everybody to look into the distance. And whilst looking into the distance, you trample over the world that is here now whether it's a world of technology, but more importantly, a world of biodiversity, of cultures and so on that are already here, that are the result of uh, a very large amount of evolution through time. I think future is an old paradigm word and it's already on the way out. Paul Sappho, probably one of the, the most famous um, of futurologists um, who founded the Institute for the Future, has left it and pronounced that the word future is broken and we should never use that again. Things are hopelessly overrated. Um, the Internet of Things, okay, we, we, uh, it, uh, we've had this discussion here. In the last 10 years, I've been trying to get somebody to tell me what, to what question is the Internet of Things an answer. Very, very rarely does one get a terribly convincing or even inspiring answer. If there is not a clear and dramatic answer to the question, to what um, question is the Internet of Things an answer? To me, I don't think the case is proven that we should invest one euro or one hour of our time in bringing it about. I think there are some of those applications. Have you not heard the previous five minutes? Because I shall demand an extension. Okay, can you hear now what I just said before? Okay, fine. So things, yeah. We can do without things. Large, uh, we've heard this notion of poverty as living on $10 or $2 or whatever a day. It is of indeed an aspect of poverty that you don't have $1,000 a day to spend on products, but it's also an aspect of social quality. It's a positive aspect of some people's lives that they don't have a world full of things. Big subject we can come back to later. Digital is a very questionable uh, thing. It's a tool, it's a layer of infrastructure that we've all, I guess, 
made our livings at, two big problems with digital. The first is that it's a layer of infrastructure that has been accompanied by and has caused and enabled a very radical increase in the resource flows and uh, therefore emissions and impacts of the economy. It's not that the internet replaced all that went before. The internet was added to what was already there and amplified it. Our use of paper has gone up eight times since we invented ethernet, just an obvious example. But the second problem with digital is because it's not analog, it's another step backwards from our awareness of the state of the world in which we live and of which we are a part. Digital is like a kind of spraying ourselves over with some kind of antiseptic uh, gas that uh, causes us, it adds to our blindness to the state of the planet and the state of our body, which are all part of the same. There are positives, of course. I've made my work out of it, but digital is not by itself a good thing. None of these words are by themselves a good thing. Innovation, maybe. Future, maybe. Thing, not too many of those. Digital, good and bad. And I think that a couple of people mentioned yesterday, how do you make choices about how to innovate or what to innovate in the absence of a kind of higher set of values? And I spent the last few months asking people and looking around about you know, where do people in a less kind of frenzied tech environment look to for inspiration about how to make decisions about their lives? 1946, a forester and a biologist called Aldo Leopold wrote these words, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And we could call biotic community as another word for biosphere. And I'm going, to, I think for, I'm going to use that from now on. I will apply that to every uh, decision and situation I encounter. And I think it's a rather clear statement of principle and ethical framework for uh, us. We can argue about it. But if you cannot prove that an action will not diminish the capacity of the biosphere to support life, then we shouldn't do it. Simple. So that should have been my uh, first five minutes. I've lost my clock. Um, but it's to do with this notion where you have to move on. Making stuff and creativity about making new stuff is the past. We're in a big sort of upheaval and transition. We're going into a new world in which what we create, restore, as the previous speaker said, is the benchmark of a successful activity. In the end, this is another guy from um, uh, that period of time, we will be judged not by what we create, but by what we refuse to destroy. So that's the end of my sermon. I need, I don't have a clock. Does anybody have clocks? Ah, so when did I start? I've had 13 minutes. Seven minutes, oh, I'm doing fine. So I want to talk about four stories now about uh, people who are not necessarily uh, having heard sermons like that, but are doing stuff in the world which correspond to the notion that moving forward and dealing with this uh, challenge is not necessarily just about stuff or technology or whatever. Two weeks ago, I was at the Transition Towns Conference in London, an amazing group of people in two or three respects. The main one being that they have not waited for me or you or politicians or anybody else to give them permission or instructions or action plans about saving the planet. There are now 193 towns formally organized to uh, carry out this activity. There are 650 other towns are in a kind of preparatory mode. And what they are all doing is at a level of a community saying, okay, supposing that it's true that the energy will uh, start to be rare, supposing that the climate change impacts are as maybe real as they're saying, how will our community survive and prosper if some of these things happen? and they call this uh, kind of planning process, energy descent action planning. And in that meeting in London and all over Europe, and it's spreading to America, but there's other equivalents in other parts of the world, these very diverse groups of people are getting together and saying, what do we have by way of assets? What are we missing in order to survive? And what are we gonna do, practically speaking, to fill in the gaps? And just, you can see unbelievable energy, but in a very kind of beautiful, uh, not frenzied, not apocalyptic, practical discussions about what needs to be done at a community or regional level. And it's all about this word resilience, which is 
to me, a great weight off my shoulders because I've always thought the word sustainability is a very sad word. It's a kind of zero-sum word. And I've never met anybody who wants to work all their lives to achieve a state of uh, sustainability. It's sad. Resilience is something that is interesting. It comes from engineering, comes from biology, it comes from social movements, the capacity of a system, a social one, a natural one, or an industrial one, to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change. And that's what those six, seven, eight hundred groups of citizens just in the transition town bit of this are now busy doing. So under the heading of where do I go to get started, that is one of the places to go to get started. What all of these groups start with and tend not often and sort of get stuck with is the subject of food because no food, uh, no us. It's a huge subject. What has happened so far is that we've become aware that our food systems are fragile and uh, not sustainable. And uh, at the moment, what happens is that architects have picked up on the kind of zeitgeist and get the Photoshop thing saying, spray greenery onto buildings. And so the picture on your right there is what uh, architects have basically started to do in urban planners, make cities green by spraying plants onto the pictures. S we're coming through that kind of phase of the journey to an understanding that actually planning food sheds is, and designing them and operating them, at, let alone getting food from them, is actually quite complicated. Uh, and it's about looking at a whole variety of different resources. And it's not at all about putting lettuce farms on top of skyscrapers. That's a tiny, tiny bit of it. It's to do with looking at all the different elements of a food system, not just in the city, but in the region, and figuring out how they work together and how they can be looked after and how they can be reconnected to each other, including the watersheds. The watershed and the food shed are not two separate situations, including the things that are already happening in the cities, including things that are being um, ignored, such as empty spaces, including uh, maps and uh, evaluations of what these different possibilities could be. So here are two maps that show places in a city where one could grow food. This is not to say that this answers the question, but it's a, this notion of mapping that which we already have and then asking the question, how can we make these resources work well together. This is a fabulous French map of every street and farmer's market for the last two years. And this is a bit further along the coast, but it's one of those things where once you start to look for distribution models or web or interactions between producers and consumers, you find these historical patterns, which are very handy because these farmer's markets originated through history for a reason. Don't reinvent too many wheels. And it's not just about going back to very, very primitive forms of growing food with uh, sort of oxen and uh, plows. We need to use technology, innovation, and science to find ways to gr generate large volumes of protein and nutrition using very little energy, but not necessarily doing it in fields with people with straw hats. But the biggest thing that we all have to grab, and I don't have an answer to this, is the sheer number of people that will be involved in uh, designing and operating food sheds. The people who own the land, the social organizations, thousands of them for any place, the companies that have a contribution to make in terms of their own science base and so on, the small ones that operate in every community. It's a big subject. The main proposition here is um, that learning how to uh, design a food shed with these many different actors and participants is probably the single biggest challenge we have in retro uh, reorganizing our cities and our food systems. It's not so much about technical solutions or even business models. It's about the sheer social complexity of getting all these guys to uh, uh, collaborate together. So that's a kind of complicated one, which we can come back to another time. So food is one. The other one is the subject of health. If we can't look after ourselves, we uh, certainly won't be able to look after the planet. And many people I know in this room, and I've encountered over the years, these big, complicated, messy technology solutions to health, not to mention the horrific and, in my opinion, amoral and depraved idea that technology is an answer to aging. I think it's a sick idea, and I re just reject it, full stop, completely. Um, but the, we have 20 years of people trying to change health systems from either the top or from the center. Mr. Obama is going to have another go now. 
And the beauty of the technology that happens in this new generation is that people can go and change things profoundly without waiting for these big centralized heavy projects. Hello Health in Brooklyn, nine months old project. Um, they, five doctors said, why do we have to work in these horrendous big hospitals? And one of them was in uh, Holland uh, who told me, he went to Alsmere, he said, they treat flowers better in Europe than they treat the patients. How can we give, use the tools of logistics and scheduling and simple connectivity to increase the contact between a doctor and a sick person? Answer, make a platform called MICA in, I think, four months, two people, four months, which is a kind of uh, simple Facebook type interface to the public person and a kind of planning and scheduling tool for the doctors with uh, just all the lessons we've learned for the past 10 years on social uh, tools to work to make it easier. I am sick. I want to see a doctor. I choose a doctor. The system connects me to the doctor and tells me how much it will cost. Uh, the system tells me where to go. And then I have a doctor who comes to my door, which is what everybody says they want. But all the Accentures, I'm sorry if you're from Accenture, but all these ministries and the health systems cannot achieve that simplicity because they think their job is to change massive systems rather than to go step aside and say, two human beings, doctor, sick person, what is the lightest, smartest, quickest, and easiest way to connect them to each other? Four and a half minutes, dash. Another health project. I'm going to just go quickly through this because I really want to just make the point that um, this is a project in the northeast of England that we did in this project called DOT about a sexual health service. It's a bit like family doctors, but different where the people said, how do we make a sexual health service for one million people? And in their minds was a very large building filled with expensive machines and highly trained people. Uh, to cut a two-year project too sh short, we learned that uh, decentralizing the whole concept of the contact between the expert and the young person or the expert and the drug user was the answer. And it was about uh, radically decentralizing things, but not doing so in reports, but making prototypes that we put into the field. Uh, again, very, very light, and the technology arrives at the, right at the end of the project to support it. Monumento is under the general heading of no more stuff is needed. In uh, Brazil, there are 4,000 uh, empty buildings in Sao Paulo alone. So the mayor says, we have, I think, 4 million people living in favelas, in good and bad ones. We have all these empty buildings. What would it take? to refit and repurpose some of these 4,000 office buildings to make them social, living, production, food, and water systems. Uh, on the left, you see the square where the building is located. And then this is a kind of, you have to look at the Monumento website to see a year's worth of work. The basic idea is that the building is already there and will need some technical modification, but not a whole housing estate. We have the space with Coloco and Exist. Then we say, what is in Sao Paulo now that can help bring knowledge and equipment and systems to bear without starting from zero? Meta Rechitleglem, which is a kind of incredible grassroots movement of recycling electronic components, have been there for five years. Most people in Sao Paulo and most people in these so-called underdeveloping countries have connectivity, but just not the kind that we're used to. They use the stuff that we've thrown away, they make it work, they get connectivity and performance. And so we bring those guys, put them in the building, the Monumento building, and say, okay, how can you give us connectivity in this building without uh, vast amounts of expensive and uh, pointless hardware? The word squelette, I'll tell you about another time, but it's basically this notion of how do you kind of colonize an old office building for a community of people? And I will then end quickly on what I think is the most important thing is what can you do on Monday or next week to actually start this kind of work? Because my basic proposition, as you've heard, is that we don't need to invent a very large amount of new stuff. What we have to do is to go and find people innovating, changing, and reorganizing aspects of daily life that are already there, but often invisibly. So the City Ecolab, it's a model, it's an event which can be one day or two weeks, it can be 10 people or it can be 50,000 people. The basic idea is to look for the resources that are already there and make them visible. Select the most interesting solutions. Showcase the projects to each other. And then 
then and only then figure out which tools and expertise might be useful to help those people do what they're doing better and faster. Resources can be empty buildings, like we saw in Sao Paulo. This is in Saint Etienne. It can be scenarios. Francois Jigou is going to talk about that later. People doing things that could be done a bit different. Uh, it could be individuals in the town or in the region that have an idea that have done a project but need help. It can be small companies that have started to be the future that we're all talking about in abstract. For example, demotorized transport, which you see here in Saint Etienne in many places. You see people now, today, making permaculture installations in urban contexts, which we read about in books, or we think that in the future we should do that. They are there. Find those people, make them visible, and see what they need to do more of it. Food, more food, tea, medical, it's all there. This is from a very kind of tough part of France. Fantastic variety of herbal remedies and stuff just within 10 kilometers of where we did the show, etc. people, and so on. And I want to finish on the notion of uh, tools and platforms, because most of us here, I guess, are tool makers and platform builders. Um, what could those be to put into an environment where we've made all these grassroots projects visible? Two kinds, really. Most of them are not necessary. Things to help us see things more clearly. Things to remove this digital blind spot between our bodies and the planet. That's a whole series of tools to, so to speak, open our eyes and open our bodies to what is happening to the biosphere. And secondly, tools and resources, tools and platforms to help us share resources in a radically more effective way. Land sharing. It says naught, but I'm going to go on for one more minute. Is that all right? Uh, websites to help people share land. Help uh, systems to help people share time. The money system, we don't need the money that has been stolen by Goldman Sachs. They can keep that. We will make our own money, and we will be happier than they will. I promise you that. It's a simple solution. This is the Lewis Pound. A whole list of tools and platforms that already exist out there, m manual, undeveloped, clunky, ugly, often would be very offensive to your sensibilities. Fine. Go there. Offer your expertise. Make them more functional, make them more scalable, make them more beautiful to use and to experience. That is what you are good at, but don't do it sort of in abstract here. Go out to these communities and offer your assistance to them because uh, that's where the action is and you'll have a lot of fun if you do that. Thank you.